All right, last talk of the day, and that too lightning one, so I hope you are still excited. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Yash. I work with cloud security in Google, and let's talk about developing serverless. So serverless applications, a quick recap, uh, in principle are developed as independent functions and jobs, which can be invoked and orchestrated as required. This approach helps limit the time in which application does not really use the resources assigned, and this helps reduce the infrastructure costs as expected. In Kubernetes world, we can use jobs and cron job console that we have for these. And when you're architecting any new application or any service, one of the crucial decisions that you will always have to appear before you is whether to go with serverless or a full-fledged server, microservice basically. And there are certain use cases where one is clearly better. Like if you have a complex logic perhaps, or if you have tight integration between different uh, microservices, you would probably want to go with the full-fledged microservice in those cases. Versus if you have a lowly coupled application, maybe some kind of a batch processing, you would have serverless as an obvious choice for that. So if you try to plot a qualitative graph uh, between the confidence you have against an architecture and against the parameters that you have, let's say application startup time, for example, there's almost always a sudden change in the preference. Like in this example, the more your application is predicted to have a higher uh, availability, the lesser would be the benefits of using serverless. And similar patterns holds for almost all other parameters you have. So if you combine several such parameters, what you would have is some kind of a countless interval. Like in this middle rectangular area you see over here, where things are a little too close and too uncertain for comfort and would probably require a lot more research. And yet over time, things can still go the other way. And it all depends. That's because at the time of architecting, you're essentially making a prediction. It could be the number of services, the type of and uses of customers. Maybe the application uses patterns could change over time. Integrations of services that you're expecting would not be holding true in the future. And all these long-term decisions may as well be in long-term not so what you had planned right now. And especially in these uncertain, this uncertain area that we talked about. So because of this kind of a system, right, it's kind of natural to take a risk-aversive approach where applications are first developed in a generic way like microservice, and maybe all optimizations would come later. This is especially significant in CI-CD models where things are, the time is the most valuable resource and you would probably want to be a little risk-averse. And the thing is, right, when you do this kind of a thing, you know, once the applications are deployed, due to sheer number of metrics, applications, it's generally very difficult and time-consuming to revamp the applications. And the result is basically the same, right? So serverless are not really used very effectively. So how do we go about reversing this trend? So let's take a simple use case of a service that is essentially running as a uh, microservice but performs kind of a batch processing. And it may be driven by some event. And if you try to fix it, one effective way is to look at the resource utilization, right? And it's quite intuitive to think if you have a batch processing system that application usage in any resource would probably be looking like a spike, or if you are uh, in certain specific cases, it may as well be a seasonality, like a repeating pattern. So this looks so simple, but identifying these patterns are not that simple in Kubernetes, right? You may have such patterns varying with time, maybe these uh, patterns are different for different resources, maybe they are dependent on how other customers are interacting with their application that may not be at all same, right? And sometimes there's an effect causality thing as well, where one application has a pattern, but it's creating such kind of patterns in all the interactions that it has with other services. And sometimes, you know, even for small cases, it's not that simple to figure out what is the source and what is the extension for that particular thing. And because of these things, right, uh, it was the same problem that we often faced in our infrastructures as well. And this is the problem set that we tried to fix. So how, did we, how do we identify the most or suitable candidates for serverless architectures in a system among thousands of services that we are running and considering the other problems that we just discussed. So we started with the same intuition of looking for data, uh, but in a slightly different way. We first collected the source utilization data for all the services. You can use Prometheus or any other observability tool that you might be using. Then we also collected the application interaction data this can be leveraged directly from network service mesh or any monitoring tool that might be using. This helps build this interaction graph that tells us what exactly is the source of any pattern that is created in your, that you might be seeing in the future. 
So as an example, uh, in this, we have four applications together in a single span. All of these may have a very similar pattern, but in this case, we would know that service A was the one who, which invoked this particular uh, pattern. So once we have this, it's all about data then. So we often use uh, several models. One of the things that we use in our case was to figure out how to dereference this particular data that we have time series into its components. So we used a model called uh, seasonal ARIMA, which is a common pattern to extract the trends, seasonality, and noise from a data. And once we did this, it, we did a, something called spike modeling, where we tried to figure out if the spikes we are seeing in this data are actually significant or not in the first place. So once you have these two things done, what you have is essentially a, a area or time uh, bifurcation where you can see if an application is active or inactive in that case. You do this for all the resources that you want to do, uh, and you get a collective overlap of all these resources, how exactly the picture looks like. Like as an example, you may first, an application might first be doing some kind of uh, reads followed by some processing and then some writes. You would probably see some uh, uh, spikes in the network egress a lot earlier than maybe the CPU spikes and then so on. So as a whole, you this gives you the complete picture when you consider multiple such uh, resources. And once you have this, it's quite uh, easy. The work is cut out. You have two different areas. One is the uh, idle interval where you can maybe scale on the resources. And the other one is basically the one where application is not so, uh, is the one where actually it's doing the major part of the, uh, of the work. And you would probably want to focus your, uh, the time at which application runs on those intervals. So this is what the overall thing that we did look like. First, detect the seasonality, detect the modeling that we want to do for the resources, figure out the spikes, figure out what exactly the resource and the timing look like, where the application is run doing the most of the jobs, and finally aggregate across resources and get this uh, uh, as a complete picture. So we leverage uh, a lot of things from the LLM as well. Uh, one such example I've given for a prompt here. Hope it's big enough. Uh, so this is a prompt that I'm giving is going to be using, I think, 1 million tokens of window. And this basically is for generating the first part, first step. This helped us generate uh, uh, and fit the model which we're trying to fit for the sample data that we had. So once we did this for all the stages, uh, uh, I'll just show how exactly this system that we tried on worked and looked like. So we used to have. Uh, I think around 50 services in this particular organization that we tried to dis, uh, run this. And we considered very standard 10 metrics that we all have used, CPU, memory, network ingress, egress, disk usage, et cetera. And upon evaluation, we realized that we have around 19 such applications which had seasonal and bursty kind of usage patterns. And five of them were the main source of seasonality in those 19. So as such, we only had to qualitatively uh, evaluate only five out of those 50 original services. And we considered two di different revamp techniques. One was to basically split the application into a kind of control plane, which handles the uh, uh, incoming requests. And the second one is basically uh, the, the revamped uh, Kubernetes job running the batch processing system. The second one was basically more of a crude thing where you don't have a really lot of time or uh, thing, your application is lightweight. You can reuse the same application in terms of uh, run the application itself as a job despite the fact that it's really a server, and do a maybe a horizontal or vertical pod auto scaling and uh, play around with the counts of the service that you have. So one uh, very unique example that we also got was basically to use a hybrid approach, right, where we use Kubernetes jobs for uh, tenancy-based uh, processing. For every customer, we leveraged uh, or we orchestrated basically uh, these jobs every single, in some periodic intervals. And we also created a, uh, 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 replicas. We still keep them, kept them because this helped us with all those regular API calls that uh, you may get ad hoc and uh, for any support that you would want to do on the fly. So this is what we did for one of the other applications that we had. And as a whole, this was the main uh, result that we got. So we saved close to $3,200 in just three applications that we had uh, tweaked down. Uh, this was close to around 20% of uh, uh, improvement in the cost of goods sold on the service. And we also realized 15% lesser uh, failure rates of container restarts and 
uh, uh, failures across different type of uh, things in all those 19 replicas that we discussed. In addition, we are also able to figure out uh, kind of a false positive seasonality, which we realized that it was not the case. And then it eventually it figured out that this was a kind of a heavy resource intensive lightness check that was happening. And we were able to fix that as well. And finally, as a good thing, we were able to get unknowingly uh, anomaly detection system uh, working for us where we could probably detect any kind of changes in patterns in real time. So that's the whole thing that we did over the period of time. And this was the result that we got. Uh, that's all I have right now uh, in the interest of time. But of course, if there are any more questions, I'll be happy to answer them offline. So that's all. Thank you so much.